All right, good evening everyone. And welcome to tonight's Board of Ed meeting. The date is Tuesday, February 27, 2018. And I wanna remind you this meeting is being recorded and please turn off your cell phones. Ellen, can you please do the roll call? Thank you, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Present. Mr. Healy? Here. Ms. McCurdy? Here. Ms. Moon? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Vice Chairperson, Mr. Hill? Chairperson, Mr. Mrs. Granado? Present. And Weathersfield High School student representative, Mr. Justin Bianchi? All present. Thank you. I want to invite a group from Emerson Williams to come on up front here and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks to all of you from Emerson Williams. Mr. Emmett, I understand we have two recognitions tonight. We do, we have uh, two staff student recognitions this evening. If I could please have the uh, group from Emerson Williams please come to the podium. Good evening, Mr. Emmett, Chairperson Granado, and the entire Board of Education. My name is Neela Takor, and I'm the principal of Emerson Williams Elementary School. Over the past couple of weeks, I have been very emotional regarding the power to impact change, sorry, there's a lot of feedback here, of the high school students in Florida, as I am sure many of you have been as well. Their passion, their eloquence, their organization, their follow through, their writing, and their ability to mobilize so quickly as cohesive units has been truly astounding in Florida and across the country. No matter what side of the aisle you stand on, it has been impossible to not listen to what these students have to say. I am very proud that the Weathersfield Public School System has adopted a civic responsibility goal for our students. Our students need to understand that there is a very complicated and interesting world outside of themselves and that this world that we live in can always be improved by them. This monumentally important realization needs to come at an early age and then be fostered and nurtured every step of the way. We are creating and molding the next generation of children who will make this world a better place for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, etc. I find it so amazing that we are right now playing a big part as educators in making this happen. Civic responsibility is a very big deal at Emerson Williams. For example, we have second graders who are very passionate about animals who are in shelters and wanting to make sure that their basic needs are being met. We have third graders who are very dedicated to protecting our environment and educating our entire school community about very important recycling practices. We have fifth graders who have created student-friendly ways for their peers to report concerns anonymously about bullying. And tonight, as you can see, I have brought with me a pretty amazing group of sixth graders who took on a very lofty goal of raising a lot of money for Connecticut Children's Medical Center, a hospital they greatly support because they know what happens there to help children of all ages. I am so proud of these students who are standing with me here this evening. I'm proud of their commitment to this project and for giving, so much, giving up so much of their free time to help others. The brainstorming, the planning, and the hard labor were all huge parts of their efforts. Having this opportunity here tonight to publicly share with all of you what they did is another important part of their learning and their experience in truly embracing what civic responsibility is all about. So thank you all so much for giving them this opportunity tonight. 
At this time, I would like to introduce grade six teacher, Allie Reynolds, and grade six mom, Kami Molika, as they were the supportive and nurturing advisors to these amazing students every step of the way on their journey. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison Reynolds, and I have four of 13 kids who worked really hard on this project. They put together a slideshow presentation to show you, and um, wrote it all up, and so they're gonna present to you their project. Okay, first I have Kaylee Casarino. She's gonna talk to you a little bit about what we did to plan our fundraising event. of getting ready for stripes a -thon. We started by writing letters to, well, there was an announcement from the sixth grade teachers saying that there was gonna be a committee to help CCMC. And right away, a few kids were probably just thinking in their head, well, I wanna write that letter. So they were writing a letter saying why they would be a good committee member and why they, like, what their ideas were. And all of them had the great, like, had really great letters, so everyone got into the committee, and they were really happy to join. We had two people helping us that were like the like the most like I don't know how to say it, but they were the hugest people, like the most important people that helped. Sorry, important <laughs> people that important people that helped us. It was Frankie's mom, Cami, and. Mrs. Reynolds. And during this process, we had, we got assigned jobs to, to, so we can get ready. And um, one of them was for people to go to Dunkin', Do Dunkin Donuts, Subway, and the New York Pickle Deli, Stop and Shop, Leo's Pizza, Village Pizza, and the Big Y to ask if they would like to donate food. And they did. Then some other people in our community got assigned to go to classrooms to explain um, like what the whole Stripes of Dawn event is all about. And then there was two people um, <coughs> that helped us figure out what kind of songs we were going to do at the Stripes of Dawn for the DJ. We also had people in our committee get assigned to figure out what kind of games and activities that were going to be held at the <coughs> event. And then last, we had people put together decorations, so it wasn't all like <laughs> um, And then, while the people that got assigned to go to like Dunkin' Donuts and all like the restaurant kind of things, they went to Puerto Vallarta to ask if they can have a night there where when the people go in to eat, they can donate money to the Stripes of Dawn event. And we raised a pretty good amount of money and they also gave us 20% of their sales. Oh yeah, and then last, um, um, the people were going, but there was also, I think it was in December, there was a holiday store that EW was doing and some of the people in the committee went there to go help and um, get some donations for them. So we raised money at, um, the holiday store by asking for donations and Puerto Vallarta made donations and we also sold tickets to our event and now Angie Bosco is going to tell you about our event strikes with them. Here's a picture. Okay, so um, our event was called Stripes a thon because our mascot is Stripes the Tiger. Um, each student from the committee that could go to, to the event got a role. Either they could be um, an MC or a morale captain, and they made sure that everything or everyone was having fun. Um, during the event, we had two patient stories that were from EW. Um, they were patients from CCMC, and they shared their experiences and why they went to CCMC and 
and how CCMC helped them. Um, we had um, a few students from UConn attend our stripes -a -thon. They were, um, some of them came to our school in the first place to, um, to present to us about um, husky -thon. And um, we also had a surprise guest, Mrs. Connecticut. Um, we had a lot of activities at stripes -a -thon. We had games such as ball in a basket and giant tic-tac-toe, which were smaller games. And um, we also had contests such as a hula hoop contest and a limo contest, which were with um, a lot more people. And the winners of each contest got a um, got to pie a teacher. There's a <laughs> there's a DJ there that was, that came free of charge, and we danced and we did line dances such as Cupid Shuffle, um, Macarena, and um, Cotton Eye Joe. There was also a face painter there free of charge, and it was a lot of fun. Okay, so like Angie mentioned, we came, we were inspired by a Yukon event called Husky Thon, and um, we were invited to their event after our event, and Frankie is gonna talk next and tell you more about that. So at Husky Thon, it is an event where kids are on their feet for 24 hours, dancing, raising money, versus Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Eight, 18 hours. <laughs> the money we raised went straight to the Yukon Husky Thon's grand total. Every hour was a, there was a morale dance where everyone would be on their feet for 15 to 10 minutes dancing to the same dance. There were more than just dancing activities. There was making frisbees, and there was um, keychain making, uh, t-shirt making, and um, there was bouncy houses, bouncy houses. After the morale dance, there were patient stories for the patients that were there. The whole reason why Husky Bound was a thing was because the patients at CCMC could raise money for them. And the patients would tell everyone like, about their like, problem and why they're there right now. Okay, and last up we have Sarah Morrissey to talk about our totals and Husky Thon. Jonathan was a, smaller, was a smaller organization for schools in Connecticut. The leaders of, John, of the Jonathan program go to schools to introduce Husky Thon and, John, and the Jonathan's program. They told us that they raised money for CCMC, Connecticut Children's Medical Center. We were interested, and this was how the idea for Stripes of Fun began. There was a Jonathan hour during Huskython where the schools who participated with Jonathan presented the money that they raised. When we arrived for the Jonathan's hour, we were surprised to see the variety of students. There were magnet schools, elementary schools, and even a high school. We lined up by school, and it was time to present our checks. The college students close to us made a tunnel with their arms, and we ran through. When we presented the check, the crowd roared with applause. We were warned before that no matter how much money any of the schools raised, everybody was going to applaud because something that they tell everybody was every penny counts. Finally, we have totals. We had a goal of $1,000 at stripes -a -thon. We more than tripled that goal, raising. $3,415. The Jonathan goal to which we contributed was $30,517.43. And finally, the Husky Thon total with a goal of $1 million. They made one million twenty one thousand four hundred and eighty five dollars and thirty seven cents. Hi everybody, I'm Cami. I am Frankie's mom. Um, I kind of presented this a while back to Mila um, because my daughter is one of the Connecticut children's patients that attends Husky Thon as a patient story. 
Um, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And the next thing you know, I get the phone call, and it just kind of snowballed. And the amount of work that these kids put in was miraculous. I mean, it, as Neela said to me at one point, sixth graders are notoriously selfish, and these kids put that away. <laughs> it's true, though. We're talking 11 and 12-year-old kids that are very much about themselves. And they put all of that aside. And during their event, they were on their feet for four hours. Um, and we were talking kindergartners up through the sixth graders. And everything was donated. We had our DJ was donated. The materials that were there were donated. Our face painters were actually one of my daughters and um, Miss Wolkett who didn't wear her crown because she didn't want to take any anything away from what was going on. And these kids just ran with it. They did a 50-50 raffle, which made a ton. And then the winner of the 50-50 raffle, I won't mention any names, ended up giving the money back at the end of it. Um, but they, they really, really, I mean, they did a lot. And even though when you look in comparison to what Husky Thon raised of over a million dollars, that $3,000 may not seem like a whole lot, but for a group of 11 and 12 year olds who thought that they were only gonna have to raise 1,000, that was incredible. And I, I give them a lot of credit for what they did. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have questions about what we did? Were there any questions about what these guys did? I just wanna thank the whole Emerson Williams community. That's an amazing feat and uh, congratulations. And you did a- Yeah, they did great. And you guys did a great job up at the podium. Congratulations. <laughs> any questions? Anybody have any questions? Oh, I didn't have a question, but again, I'd like to comment. I'm not only just blown away by this, um, by this effort, by, um, by this group of kids, but also the fact that your presentations were so um, articulate. And it's a, this is such a great um, presentation. Thank you for starting our meeting out on such a great positive note. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. John? Yeah, I just want to thank you uh, as well. But not only that, but you're leaving a legacy. It's, it's Emerson Williams. <laughs> and maybe next year, sixth graders could take on this uh, project to do it. So you could give them a challenge, and then maybe they'll come out and do it with you, and you can help them out. But not only that, but uh, are you thinking of going to Yukon now that you went to that? <laughs> no, but thank you very much. You're great kids. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Neela. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, at this time, it gives me great pleasure to uh, have come to the podium Miss Donna Schulke from the Connecticut Association of uh, Public Schools. Sally DeStoli, and Sue Zappler. I'd also like to invite Judy Kina. Uh, Good evening, everybody. So, uh, tonight, it's with great honor that we celebrate a very dear and special organization from Wethersfield and their impact on the Wethersfield Public Schools. The Richard M. Keene Foundation and the 9-11 Memorial Sports Center was established after Richard Keene and two other Wethersfield men died in the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. This nonprofit foundation is dedicated to their memory and the purpose posted on their website, which reads, the purpose of the foundation, in collaboration with the town of Wethersfield, is to provide a safe and fun environment in which youth can come together to participate in athletic, academic, and social programs with the support and guidance of caring adults. While a monumental project, the building of the Memorial Sports Center was just the beginning of a 16-year partnership with the town of Wethersfield. Over the years, the after-school programs for students have moved from the Memorial Sports Center to each individual school. The Keen on Kids after-school enrichment program was a verified success last year, with about one-third of the elementary students in all five elementary schools enrolled in a creative after-school program. That was over 1,800 enrollments, really amazing. 
Programs from gardening and tennis to cooking, chess and musical were all well attended in the spring. This fall, there were additional unique offerings such as aviation, fashion design with denim, and magic tricks. Personally, that's the one I want to go to. <laughs> the foundation is also sponsoring the spring 2018 musical program, Aristocrats, the one at one of the elementary schools. At the middle school, the Keene Foundation supports several after-school programs and opportunity. Due to their gener generosity, SDMS has an intramural program open to all students Monday through Thursday. Students have the opportunity to participate in a variety of sports and activities. We are also fortunate that our own SDMS library is also open Monday through Thursday until 420. Students can drop in, work with peers or a teacher on assignments and research. A few years ago, the Keene Foundation also secured a $50,000 grant from a corporation for Wethersfield Public Schools that provided a hands-on science program from the Connecticut Science Center in every single classroom in grades kindergarten through eight. What an engaging opportunity for our students to explore the wonders of science. At Wethersfield High School, the foundation finds ways to support and celebrate student interests, such as the Pieces Literary Magazine. The Empty Bowls Project is, a, is committed to raise awareness for, and financial support for food insecurity in our community. It has grown from one school to a district-wide collaboration, thanks to the foundation. We also see the work of Judy Keene and the foundation throughout the greater Wethersfield community. The foundation also supports the Wethersfield Food Bank, programs at the Senior Center, and the Hunger Action Team. So I've gone through about three pages, and this list is yet a very, very small snapshot of just the last few years of support the King Foundation has provided the youth of Wethersfield. In an article published in the Huffington Post, I read a caption entitled, after 9-11, hundreds of charities launched. Now, here are just a few left standing. The article went on to state that out of hundreds of nonprofits created after 9-11, only a very small handful of them were still active in 2014. We are extremely proud to be standing here with Judy Keene and the uh, entire Keene Foundation. We are proud to be partners with the Keene Foundation and they are just as dedicated and passionate and we can say even stronger about the foundation's mission than they were 16 years ago. The CAST Distinguished Friends in Education Award is the highest award given by CAST to organizations not directly involved in public education. So tonight, it is our honor to have nominated the Richard M. Keene Foundation Board of Directors, including all of their former students and community partners, many who are here tonight, for the CAST Distinguished Friends in Education Award. On behalf of the Board of Education and the entire school district and the entire community, we are incredibly proud to be a partner with all of you and awe in the work you do to benefit the youth and families in Wethersfield each and every day. So I'm going to turn this over to Donna Schulke. Well, this is an honor to be here tonight to be part of this presentation. It's always an honor and a privilege to present an award anytime <coughs> to anyone but it's especially really poignant tonight to be here in my community that I grew up in and still live in, and to be giving it to a woman who I respect on a personal level and as a foundation member, and somebody who turned certainly adversity into a very positive thing, which is one of the best lessons any one of us can learn in our lives, and I hope you young people hear that. Judy, you are an amazing, amazing woman. To impact one student's life, one child's life is such a special thing to do, to impact thousands of students' lives, let alone their families, is miraculous. You are very special, and I know humble, so it's really nice to be here tonight. I am the Assistant Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Schools, and CAS established this Distinguished Friend of Education Award in 1983 to honor organizations like the Keene Foundation that have generously contributed resources and expertise that channel into really helping kids to become expanded in their educational opportunities. 
CAS hosts, num un I can't even give you the number of recognition events, many, 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 but this is by far our most prestigious and the most difficult one to win. We receive dozens of nominations every year for this award, and it's always a rigorous, difficult, challenging process to choose just one. And it wasn't any easier this year. Um, the organizations that applied contribute to help better schools and communities all over the state of Connecticut. And as I said, this was no exception. However, the fact that the Keene Foundation was chosen for this award from such a, a large and impressive group of nominees gives testimony, true testimony, to the depth of its impressive group, uh, impressive um, contributions and the breadth of its great influence. And that's what I think um, many people may not realize. The influence goes way beyond the town of Weathersfield, way beyond. The foundation was selected for this award because Judy and her team of volunteers have given of themselves, the true act of giving of themselves, without ever looking for any kind of expected gratitude or personal benefit. And because through their efforts, they have not only impacted the lives of so many of our children, so many of our children, they've also given them those essential skills that will lead them to be better and more productive adults and citizens of our world. Judy, on behalf of CAS and the member schools we represent, which is well over a thousand, by the way, I thank you for your extraordinary efforts in following your Keene Foundation mission, which is very simply to enrich the lives of the youth of Weathersfield. Judy, you have done this many times over, young lady, many times over. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud to be with you. I want to very quickly read this. Uh, the Connecticut Association of Schools, CAS, honors the Keene Foundation of Weathersfield, Connecticut as its Distinguished Friend of Education 2018 in recognition of exemplary commitment and extraordinary contribution, contributions to education in Connecticut. And I'd also like to put in a very thankful, grateful thank you to Susan and Sally for nominating such an outstanding recipient. And Judy, before you go, you know, I think I've said to you a hundred times up here, thank you from the board. And um, I love saying it, and I'm going to keep on saying it. You have done wonderful things for our community, for our schools. Um, I our thought you were going to say very good. Huh? I was. You <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> well, I love that. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, and thank you very much, first to Sue and Sally for the nomination and to the Connecticut Association of Schools. It's, it's, we're very, very proud to be receiving this award today. And thank you. I'm so thrilled that Donna was the uh, presenter because we have a long time relationship um, here in town, so that was really touching. Um, we're also proud to be the recipient um, for our entire community that this is um, awarded to. I'd like to introduce my board of directors and those who are here, please stand up. Um, my board of directors works tirelessly. And uh, you know, for 16 years, we've had some people who helped for a while and then had to leave. But um, consistently, we have great attendance at our meetings. Howie Greenblatt um, talks about that all the time. So Howard, start by standing up. Um, Howard Greenblatt, Mark Wallace, John Curran, Mia Caulfield is here. Um, Barbara Bellis, I don't think she, oh, Barb's here too, good, good. Tom Dolan, I don't think he's here. Um, Tim Keene, he's on a contraption like Sally, he had some <laughs> surgery. Um, Carolyn Fazina, who is also our after school program director. Laura Mayo, I don't think is here. Darcy O'Connor is definitely here. Darcy's my right-hand man right now. Mike Patkowski, Ted Pinto, Mark Trayum, Alex Feliciano is here. <laughs> Colleen Matatal, she's not here. Rob Pascal and Paul Montneri. 
Some of these people have been with us since day one, so um, for that I'm eternally grateful, and um, it's been very, very helpful to me. So many people in the community should be honored tonight for all of the support that we have received since 9-11. Um, that tragic day, as we've already said, took away three Weathersfield men. It was so hard to believe that we're so far away from it, and yet three people in town. Jeffrey Bittner, David Winton, and Dick Keene. And the interesting thing is that Dick coached both of them in baseball. So there was a connection. Um, Dick used to see Jeff, I mean, uh, David on the train coming back from New York frequently on Fridays, and they had some wonderful conversations. Um, to have created a gathering space and after school programs in their honors, in their honor, seemed the way to go. It took multiple partners in the community, however, including town leadership, um, elected officials, town staff. Kathy Bagley is sitting here, and she has been with us forever as well, and Kathy's just amazing. Thank you, Kathy, for all that you do. Um, uh, and many, 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 many volunteers. You know, everybody who's lent a little bit of a hand is, is really welcome. Today, we have some of the students that have benefited by our um, programs to talk a little bit about their, um, how they found the programs. Um, first, we have students from the Weathersfield High School and the Pieces Literary Magazine. If you haven't read the Pieces Lit Mag, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So um, we have Eden Fritz Aguire. I had to get that pronunciation right. <laughs> Aguire, Michaela Dreger, and Christine Galaris. Why don't you come up? And Ruth George is with them. She's their um, media center um, director, I guess. Okay, let Mag advisor. Okay, girls, why don't you come on up? And I think um, Eden is going to be the spokesman, but you can all give her some support. Okay. Good evening. My name is Eden Fritz Aguirre, and I'm a junior at Weathersfield High School. I've been a member of the Pieces Literary Magazine since my freshman year. This group has made such an impact on my life. They're so amazing. We have artists and writers come together, and they collaborate and write beautiful pieces of work. Um, I have previously served um, as our secretary, and I am currently serving as our um, junior writing consultant. Our advisors, Ms. George, Mikhail, and Christine are our co-presidents, and they are phenomenal. Very lucky to have them. Um, during my time in this group, the Keene Foundation has provided us with many opportunities and has opened many doors for us. The Keene Foundation has provided the funding for our equipment, loads and loads of art supplies, year -end parties, and more. Because of the Keene Foundation, we have been able to go on a field trip to the Weathersfield Academy of the Arts, where we completed workshops with several of the artists and teachers from the Academy, and a workshop with Janelle Gaudet, a former WHS student and published author. The Keene Foundation has helped with scholarships to the Academy for the Arts Summer Youth Program. Without the help of the Keene Foundation, we wouldn't be nearly as successful or trained. We are honored to have the Keene Foundation as our sponsor, and we would like to congratulate them as they accept the award from the Connecticut Association of Schools for their contribution to the Weathersfield Public Schools. Thank you, Keene Foundation, from all of us in Litmac. Thank you. how far our grant went. <laughs> I didn't realize it, it covered all of that. Um, okay, now we have some uh, South Dean Middle School students, Dylan Wolf and Taylor Moran, we're, are gonna talk a little bit about how they um, are enjoying the after school programs there. Um, at our SCMS library, um, it's a really busy place and thanks to the generosity of the Keene Foundation, um, and currently, you can stay after school, you can work with a tutor, there's Minecraft Mondays, and then there are like many like trivia contests and like parties and events. I would, not necessarily a party, but. Um, <laughs> there's, a lot of parties. <laughs> <laughs> such as like Star Wars, and then I helped um, play in the Harry Potter one, which was a lot of fun, and there's been really good turnouts. And also, I love the Coke Carnival, thanks to the King Foundation, they run that. So, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Dylan Wolf. Intramurals is a good activity because it gets me active. I get to learn new sports and make new friends from both seventh and eighth grade thanks to the Keene Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. 
You know, I think I have to take just a minute and talk about DeKean's uh, philosophy about athletics. It was not to win. It was to play, to make friends, to grow, and that's perfect. Okay, Carolyn Fazina is gonna come up and tell us a little bit about the um, after school programs in the elementary schools. And Carolyn spends hours and hours um, organizing these. Um, good evening. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the really cute kids in the back of the room. Um, everybody wave. Those are some of my spectacular, or I shouldn't say mine, but I take them very, I'm, I'm, they're my kids uh, that do some of the after school programs um, at some of the various schools. I, we invited them to come and share um, with us. So um, I'm so thrilled for the Keene Foundation to be getting this award. It's great to be getting recognition um, of our after school enrichment opportunities, especially since when I think about it, it's just we're in the middle of our second year. So um, uh, we're pretty proud of our success so far. Um, the success of our after school program, I firmly believe, is because we have great partners in our program. Um, these are people and organizations who just don't, don't just say, I'm with you, I like what you're doing, but they're the ones with us doing the work planning future sessions, providing feedback on what's working and what isn't, and most importantly, engaging in, sport, in supporting our kids. Our work, uh, the first uh, group I'd like to talk about is our work with the Parks and Rec Department. It's, um, it's one of those spectacular partnerships. They have managed all the data, registrations, and given us all their expert advice about providing programming for kids. I can say with certainty that without their work and expertise, um, we would not have had the success that we're having right now. Um, the next partnership that we're very proud of is the one with our site coordinators that work at our ap um, after school at each elementary school. Um, they couldn't all be here, but Regina Vaughn is here. She's, you just wave Regina, go ahead. <laughs> She's uh, our site coordinator at Web. Um, these in individuals are really the best people that I could hope for as after school site coordinators. I'm gonna try not to get all emotional about this. It's okay. Um, they don't just supervise and make sure the kids are safe after school. They actually engage with them. Um, they ask them questions about what they're doing. They share stories. Um, one of our site coordinator always has really interesting animal photos on her phone that she, I caught her sharing with the kids one day during <laughs> attendance. Um, and many times they participate right alongside the kids during the programs. They make their own apple crisp and they do yoga and they do all the stuff that the kids are doing. Um, they are also my eyes and ears in the school. They give me feedback on how programs are going and suggestions for new classes that they hear from the kids or from other family members when uh, they come to pick up their children. Um, the other partnership that I'd like to mention that especially today is really meaningful is that um, with our school district. Um, I have been taking some education classes with the Connecticut um, After School Network and one of the things we were just talking about is how there's a direct correlation between the success of an after school program and its relationship with its school district. Um, and this right now right here is proof positive that that is really true. Um, so, um, the, prin I did just, the principals at each elementary school have been completely open to having our after school programs at their schools. They're incredibly accommodating with their time and with the school space. The support staff at each school have been incredible partners, the secretaries and um, clerks in the office. They are my point of contact and always ready to help any way that they can. And I'd also like just to take a second to acknowledge the uh, school social workers in the schools. Because of their help, we have been able to determine or um, students who may not be able to afford programming, and we have been able to provide some scholarships as well to those children. So um, without that help, we wouldn't be um, servicing some of these kids that really are getting so much out of our programs. Um, and lastly, I'd like to just recognize the families and the students here tonight. Thank you for sending your children to after school programs. They are a gift, and I mean that. Uh, I just really mean that. I taught Lego class last time. I said it was like my volume on a Tuesday. I went, and no matter what mood I was in, I came 
um, home so happy. These kids are spectacular, they're interesting, they're creative, and it's just so great to see them um, have fun all the time. Um, when I see them learning how to play the ukulele, baking something to bring home and share with their family, maybe, because some kids say that it's not sharing it, it's too good. <laughs> um, they're dancing, they're creating great art, they're performing magic tricks, they're making their own Lego creations using their own imagination, um, or just learning something new and having fun with the other kids in the room. Um, then I know we're doing something really great here. Um, please continue to share your ideas and feedback with us. I believe this is how we will continue to be successful. So again, um, thank you for the award. Um, it means so much, I think, to all of us. Um, the Keene Foundation is like probably the best group to ever work for. Just a shout out to that. <laughs> it's all good. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and for all your support. This is Thank really you. an incredible award. Thanks, Judy. Oh, it's kind of downhill after this, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of the regular Board of Ed meeting on February 13, 2018. Told you it was downhill. <laughs> um, uh, are there any corrections? Uh, yes. On the, on the February 13th one, uh, all the way down where I did the report on the committee meeting, uh, Edgenuity is the name of the program, not Ingenuity. Edgenuity? Edge. Edge. Oh, okay. E-D-G-E. It was a genius to write it that way, but it wasn't the right <laughs> Anyone else with corrections? Okay. Um, may I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Abstentions. Okay, so those minutes are approved. And also on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of the special Board of Ed meeting on February 14th, 2018. Anyone see any corrections? Okay, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Okay, a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Same. Same. Two left. Those minutes are approved. Okay. Did we have enough on that one? One, two, three. Chris, did you approve those? Yeah. Oh, he was the yeah, he said yeah. yeah. So what? <laughs> you don't get just approved minutes. You don't. You don't get them. Okay. I know you're staying. I think that's a no. I think it's okay. <laughs> all right. Are we all set, Ellen? Okay. Is there anyone wishing to make a public statement? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you, Mo, that you have five minutes. <laughs> come on up. My name is Mo Catanio. I live at 10 Sunrise Terrace, Weathersfield. I belong to the fire department for 61 years. First of all, Mr. Superintendent, I'd like to thank you for your work. And if I had to rate you people from one to 10, one being the lowest and 10 being the highest, you would all get a 10. That's all I want to know you do. My topic tonight is security at the Weathersfield High School. I was hired from Gary Burgart in 1974 they never had a uh, security guard. I was the first one there. And uh, the kids didn't accept me at first, but as we get on, I knew 30% of the families in Wethersfield. They didn't behave. I call their father at 6 o'clock at night when he's eating supper. Tell him his kid didn't behave today. Uh, I had a little motorcycle. I bought it on my own. Uh, Dan Casey was the principal at the time. And uh, I know the back of that high school like the back of my hand. 
I come here tonight to tell you people we have to be a leader for security in the town of Wethersfield. I believe we need metal detectors like the airport to get our kids in school. They will stop a nail, a screwdriver, a weapon, a pair of scissors. Once our kids are in school, we have a great policeman up there, Eric Knapp. He will take over. They're inside, we're safe. But now let's take out the outside. We have no outside perimeter security. You see what's happening in Connecticut this week, today, three. Everything. I patrolled outside. I went from the football field to the woods, through the woods, through the woods to Knott Street, found lights on, cars running, um, two kids in a car making out. I, I, didn't, I was right there, and we stopped everything at, before they entered the high school. It's time we got somebody outside with a security car, a police radio, and an inside radio. Now we stop them before they can enter the grounds. I had kids come from Hartford, Park Street, gang members, stopped them, want to see their girlfriends, pick up the radio. I got Sergeant Goldberg, God rest his soul, come out and settle the thing before they got on the grounds. So before I leave this planet, I want to express my suggestions. And I had a golf cart. I used to go around with a golf cart. I found teachers' cars open, lights on, cars running, and this is all part of security. So the only thing I'd like to say is it's not going to cost a lot of money. We can get a car, state police old car, put Weathersfield High School security, have somebody out there. We can get a car in the front of the high school with the permission of Chief Citran, a deterrent. I went to Bob's, uh, Bob's store in Newington, Christmas time. There was a cruiser there, nobody in it. Okay, where is he? What's he doing? Is he available? He's not there. But they're gonna be a deterrent right then and there. Weathersfield is not fooling around. So I just like to say, I wanna see the kids safe. They're safe inside, but they're not safe outside. I, my primary job was to stop kids from going to breakfast. That was a big thing. I used to go down, I wanted a gate down in the kids' parking lot. Somebody had to go to the doctor, orthodontist, blah, 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 blah. Call security, we open the gate, let them go. Now nobody else goes. So that was the biggest thing, is kids going to breakfast, which today is nothing compared to what's going on. So I just tell you members, it's time to act. And I'd like to see Weathersfield lead in every high school that we did something. And that's all I have to say tonight. And uh, I, I just, I know it's not gonna cost a lot of money, but um, it's, it, it's a thing we need. And as you see what happened in Florida, you see today they had five or six of them. There's copycats with the metal detectors they are gonna stop us right in the tracks. Boom, it's gonna take a while to get in school, but once they're in, we don't worry about them coming out. We already did our job. Now the policeman's in there, the school's secured. Outside perimeter. It's wide open right now. I can go to Wolcott Hill Road, I see guys with security shirts on down there. That, that don't help. I could walk right down there, nobody's gonna stop me. But if you see a guy that's coming down, he has no business there, tell him to leave or pick up the radio and call the police. And we gotta get tough. We gotta get tough. Thank you for talking to me about Bobby Granada called me and we discussed a few things. And I just had to get it off my chest. I never spoke before for anything. And uh, I live behind the high school and uh, it's all woods. There's 109 acres where Pine Acres is. And we had search parties in there. We lost kids. Um, they can come in from any side. And I patrol the football field, 
down below, through the woods, up on a Walker Hill Road, and uh, I think it's time we act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mo. Okay, anyone else, please? Hi, good evening. Hello. Um, my name is Melissa Perry, and I live at 18 Clove Hill. And my reason for um, wanting to make a comment tonight is twofold. First of all, um, I am Judy Keene's niece, and I have been a part of the Keene Foundation from the very beginning. Um, and so I feel very passionately about the award that she was granted tonight. Um, personally, I have a son who just entered the Wethersfield Public Schools and who is having a fabulous experience at Highcrest School. Um, he is now enrolled in his first Keen on Kids after school activity, which I'm sure will be the first of many for him to participate in. Um, secondly, I am the school social worker at Webb Elementary School here in Wethersfield, and so I also get to see the other side of things from the Keene Foundation. I work with many students at Webb who we would consider to be at risk and in desperate need of a connection with a caring adult and with people in the community, and the Keene Foundation has filled this need um, that we had here in district. So I couldn't be more grateful for the work and felt so strongly that I wanted to just make a comment and let the board know, um, coming from an employee and a parent of a child in district, how important the Keene Foundation is here in Wethersfield. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Mr. Emmett, you have communications to share tonight? I do, thank you, uh, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. Uh, start off this <coughs> evening actually um, kind of piggybacking on what Mr. Catania had to say. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work with him when he was a security uh, personnel at uh, Wethersfield High School. And uh, once again, we've been forced to deal with the reality of a school shooting with mass casualties. And certainly our hearts go out to those who've lost loved ones in this terrible event. This evening, I'd like to take the opportunity to share with members of the public just some of the things that we have done and put in place. Um, you know, when Parkland happened, it, it had that feeling again, like Newtown all over again. Uh, I was in my first year as superintendent when Newtown happened, and you have that feeling of helplessness. You have that feeling of, of anxiety. And we know, I can speak for every administrator in the Weathersfield Public Schools. I can speak for every employee, every teacher, every custodian. It is our um, commitment to keep this school system as safe as it can possibly be. After a new town occurred, we really worked on becoming proactive in how we responded to um, these types of events. And it dealt with our processes, it dealt with our infrastructure, it dealt with staffing. So just some of the uh, things that we've put into place over the past five years. Um, we've removed all of the collapsible walls between classrooms and built hard walls. This was done right after Newtown, both at Highcrest as well as at Hanmer. And we had applied for two of the competitive school safety grants, um, funding and supporting some of our upgrades on exterior doors. Um, we applied for two um, awards and we received two awards. Uh, Fred Bushy had a lot to do with that. We um, used capital improvement dollars for the installation of new exterior doors at Emerson Williams, Charles Wright, and Highcrest. We installed locking classroom doors within the pods at Highcrest. Highcrest is an old open school design uh, that was in desperate need of upgrades and that's now been in place. We've installed panic hardware on doors. We've installed a Raptor visitor identification system that identifies right up front when you come in as a visitor whether or not you are on a offender registry or you have any type of holes where you cannot get in to see your kids. We deal with non-custodial parent issues all the time and that Raptor system provides us with a level of security right at that front office. We've increased the number of portable radios in all buildings, including the issuance of a new police radio with direct access to the WPD. We are a button away from the Weathersfield Police Department. We've installed a phone camera buzzer systems at the front door. This has increased staff's ability to identify visitors and assess whether or not that visitor should be coming into the building. We maintain panic switches in the main office. These are directly linked to Sonitrol and the WPD. We also have those at the Stillman Building. We have hosted two active shooter training uh, protocols with the CREST team, that's the regional um, 
emergency response team. We did one at Silas Dean back in 2013, and we recently did one uh, in August of 2017 at Charles Wright. These drills take place where law enforcement comes in from the greater Hartford area and we allow them to come in and take over the school so that they can have actual tactical training. They can see the layout of our building and they can talk about um, how they need to respond. Uh, these events are intensive. There is um, a dummy ammunition used and they assess when they go in. How did it work? How can they get better at it? Um, we actually had one of our administrators, Mr. Horter, principal of Charles Wright, that um, participated and observed this so he could get that perspective. Uh, we have the provision of door magnets to allow for immediate classroom door locking in the event of emergency, as opposed to teachers trying to fumble for keys in a panic situation. We've utilized some technology as well with the promotion of the Remind Me application for notification of emergencies, lockdowns, and fire drills, where the, the principals used to have to call into the main office uh, or to call into Stillman. Now it's a direct text right on the phone from where they're at for a lockdown. We use uh, the Principalm app uh, providing student information within cell phones in the event of emergency, so principals have immediate access in the event of an emergency. Um, through the support of town council and your persistence as a board, we have installed camera surveillance systems with the DVD recording ability and direct access to the police department. And this uh, surveillance system includes Stillman Building as well as our Weathersfield Transition Academy in addition to all of our schools. We've had in a couple of our buildings the installation of window film designed to keep windows from shattering, uh, which eliminates easy entry. Um, I understand through uh, conversation with the town, we had requested this in a capital improvement budget and that has been approved through the capital improvement uh, budget. So we will have additional window filming coming up as soon as the budget um, is settled. Uh, a position that took two years, uh, those of you who've been on the board for a while can recall that, uh, but the uh, uh, creation of the Director of Security, I can tell you that since uh, Parkland has occurred, I have met at least once a day with Hal Even, uh, Hal's in the back this evening, um, in terms of going over protocols, assessing changes that we need to make. Um, Hal is in direct contact with the police department. He is in direct contact with principals. He responds immediately should there be an issue or a concern. And Hal brings with him a great deal of experience with regard to his career as a police captain with the Hartford Police Department. And he is certainly an expert that has done a great job in terms of helping us enhance that safety and security piece. Our crisis plans are currently aligned with Homeland Security standards and have been submitted to the state. Uh, you may recall that article in the Hartford Current that not all um, municipalities have been in compliance with that. We obviously conduct monthly fire drills, lockdowns, or evacuation drills, and these uh, include participation with the Weathersfield Police Department and the Weathersfield Fire Department. When we finish with one, we assess it. What went well? What didn't go well? What do we need to improve upon? I am extraordinarily proud of the direct connections that we have to the Weathersfield Police Department, including, uh, as Mr. Catania had uh, mentioned, Officer Knapp, our SRO at the high school. We also have our SOR, Bridget Kamara, at the uh, middle school. And at the elementary level, we have Officer Bob Arduini, who serves as our DARE officer, um, frequently in the buildings at the elementary level throughout the course of the school year. Um, in addition to that, we have Officer Mendez, our juvenile detective, who assists us whenever we need it. Um, I've been extraordinarily proud of the partnership we've had with the Weathersfield Police Department and feel that they are there at the drop of bat whenever we need them. In addition to the school resource officers, we have a, a school security staff both at the middle and the high school. Um, we have one officer at the uh, middle school and we have a total of three at the high school at this point in time. And this was an additional position that the board supported two years ago. That additional position has allowed us to be flexible with our support. One of the things we notice, and for those of you that go to evening meetings at the high school, the high school is a happening place. Um, I was at the high school last night until after 9 o'clock, and we had adult ed, we had the Jets team working on their, uh, their project, we had um, adult ed in as well with some of our um, extracurricular activities. The place was hopping. What we've been able to do with that additional security guard is to stagger the hours so that the building is covered after the school day. We still have a lot of uh, athletes that come into the building, and that building is always used. We've also uh, focused on making sure that our police officers are clear on layouts of buildings. They, in addition, have keys in cruisers so that they can respond immediately in the event that the building is in lockdown. We also have Knox boxes at all of our uh, buildings. That Knox box is a uh, fortified, essentially a safe, 
that uh, allows fire and police access to those buildings. I think it's important to notice also that we uh, continuously assess our plans and procedures for ways to improve and become more efficient. And as I mentioned earlier, safety of our students and our staff is of utmost importance. And we recognize that it must remain a priority. I certainly want to thank all of the parents who have provided feedback and input over the past two weeks. We've gotten numerous emails with some great ideas. We've connected some of our parents to our school safety committees and we're always looking for ways to get stronger. For our students at the high school, I must say I appreciate the attention to wearing the ID badges. That was one of the things that really is a non-negotiable. We know it may be inconvenient, we know that it may not match with what you're wearing and it may not look good, but this is not about convenience and fashion sense. This is about us knowing who you are and knowing if you don't belong in that building so we can respond to that. I also wish to remind members of our Weathersteel School community to remain alert and vigilant. If you see something or hear something, please alert us so that we may follow up with the appropriate authorities. As silly as it may sound, as trivial as it may appear, we will follow up and we will definitely um, involve the appropriate authorities. So again, with that being said, we will continue to monitor um, our buildings on a regular basis. Um, Mr. Even is out in these buildings. He's extraordinarily visible. Um, our administrative team actually will be meeting tomorrow at 8 o'clock to discuss, guess what, safety and security. So this will be an ongoing topic. You know, one of the things I think happened after Newtown was it was shocking. It was very difficult to comprehend. You thought your buildings were safe. Then we started to drift back into that sense of, of complacency again. We can't do that. We just can't. Um, as I said in my communication, I would love to be able to say I will guarantee your children will be safe. I can't. I wish I could. However, the thing that I can guarantee is that we will continue to do what we can to make sure that we are prepared and we are responsive to any type of threat that may come forward. I also want to talk with you a little bit about uh, another one of the components that's come about from the, the Parkland situation, and that is um, the response uh, to calls for walkouts. Um, one of the things that I've heard is that uh, March 14th is a date where students may be deciding to walk out. We also have another date of April 20th. I've heard that one as well. And this creates a great challenge. And you've heard across the country some superintendents that are drawing the line in the sand and saying, you know, absolutely not. You walk out of the building, you get suspended. Um, these, these challenges to superintendents and other school officials are really difficult because we have to reconcile the competing concerns of this. Giving a voice to students who are rightfully frustrated by the continued threat of violence in the schools. Two, maintaining order and discipline in the schools. And three, keeping students safe. Responding appropriately to the planned walkouts is a significant and complex challenge that we are currently working on. School officials throughout the state are planning appropriate responses to plan any planned walkouts, and we think that the key is to work closely with our students, our parents, and our district leadership to deal with any planned walkouts in a constructive and a collaborative way. The administrative team will be meeting tomorrow morning and will discuss this topic further and have additional information forthcoming to you. On a little bit of a lighter note, we had a budget workshop last Thursday. Our next budget workshop is scheduled for this Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. in the lower level conference room at Stillman. Uh, we'll also be taking to Blue Eagle News Airwaves um, to talk uh, and produce a piece on the 2018-19 uh, uh, operating budget. Just an update for the board with regard to shared services. I will try not to steal your thunder, Ms. McCurdy, because I know you'll be speaking of it as well. Go for it. Uh, one of the things that we are working on currently is the um, <coughs> sharing of services on the custodial and maintenance side. And this would be um, really contingent upon us entering into an MOU with the town, which we're currently working on now. In addition to that, we have posted a position, knowing full well that Mr. Bushy will be retiring in June of this year. We have a position for a supervisor um, that has been posted through the town. This individual will um, answer to um, Director of Physical Services, Sally Katz. However, this individual will be in our buildings on a daily basis and will be providing the daily oversight of our custodial staff and uh, supporting our school principals and ensuring that our building, uh, every one of our buildings, are uh, safe, are neat and clean, and are appropriately stocked with supplies. 
So this is a process where we are continuing on. Nothing's etched yet. However, when we have an MOU in place, we'll bring that before the board for further discussion and action. I understand also that this MOU would go before town council as well. Um, we're basing this on our ability and our actual success that we've had with the IT um, sharing of services. It's been very successful. Again, shout out to Keith Raffanello for you know, really bringing both sides together and making it a more efficient uh, process. I will say this as well. For those of you thinking that this is going to save massive amounts of money, it is not. What we're really looking to do up front is to develop efficiencies. We think down the road that we'll be able to find other areas where we can find um, additional savings. But we're looking to build our capacity here. So I'm actually excited about this and looking forward to it. And then last but not least, Ms. Granato, I'm not going to steal your thunder either, but I mentioned uh, being at the high school um, last night for an academy advisory meeting which um, is being spearheaded by Mrs. Granado as well as um, Councilman um, Lesser. I was very excited last night to have um, a, a meeting where we got to meet with parents and some members of the business community and talk about the <coughs> academy model. But you know, knowing that we have some financial constraints, also talking about the learning lunch, where we connect our um, business um, experts with our students providing shadowing opportunities for students. Um, so we've got a lot uh, on, on the horizon here with this, and I'm sure Mrs. Granato will provide us with yes. additional information on that. But um, with that, that's uh, the communication for this evening. Thank you, Michael. Anyone have a question? Chris? Just a couple. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very thorough presentation on security, which I know we all share, uh, regardless of the, the, the horrible tragedy in Florida. Um, I just have one suggestion and, one, and just one question. Uh, the drilling, the assessment, all this stuff is fantastic. Um, I'm just curious, when you talk about the, obviously involving the students and making them self-aware uh, of their surroundings, of the situation, both in the school system and outside, this gets us to the, to the, you know, the impossible task of trying to monitor social media, uh, which is certainly uh, a precursor to a lot of these horrible tragedies and some of the second guessing about uh, people that have certain emotional problems, whether they're part of the school district or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think, a bit of self-awareness that we're going to, that's a community project as well as a school project. How do we, um, you know, report legitimate concerns that we have uh, without creating a t constant sense of thought police. I know it's a very thin line, but certainly uh, I would say to the community that we, c we shouldn't worry about sometimes political correctness if, if we can approach the police or approach you folks with things that we're concerned about. We obviously, you know, when you put something on the social media, it's not private anymore. So I look at it as, you know, you're putting it out there. It's not a private conversation. It's out there for the public. So. You know, it's there to develop a response. So if we're responding as people in the community, I think we're more than within our right. My second suggestion, you know, the people that do your, uh, when you do this uh, Blue Eagle News, mm -hmm. it might be worthwhile to suggest that uh, you engage the kids in doing something that talks about security and being self-aware and things that are being done and involve them and talk to, maybe interview some of these kids, ask about some of the questions they have about it, fears that they have. I think the walkout, which I, I know we don't, want to, we don't want to touch tonight, but I think there is a way where you don't disrupt the school day and you give these uh, kids, and I think it's great that they are energized and excited and, and want to participate, but I think we have ways to channel that in a way where we're not emptying the building and having a whole host of other, I think, logistical <coughs> issues that uh, could cause, I think, uh, a detrimental effect on the, on the overall message. So I just want to compliment the work that this board has done well before I got here. Uh, and I think it's the number one question everyone wants to know when these horrible things happen. You know, what are we doing to make our, our school districts uh, incredibly safe? But it's not, we're not a fortress. We've got to reach out to the community to keep our eyes and ears open for people that may pose a threat to themselves, to others. Um, and I just want to tell you personally, you know, um, how grateful I am for all you, you've been doing on this. And again, again final point, I mean, it, it, the work never ends. I mean, it, it, it never ends. And um, 
you know, the more I think we can empower our young people to, to the sense of, you know, look up from your phones, look around, be incredibly self-aware, don't be intimidated by something that may seem odd to you, may seem threatening to you, uh, that you don't have an answer for. No, you know, don't be silent when um, it, it doesn't hurt to reach out to someone, in the, an adult or someone else to, uh, to say what you see. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chris. That was excellent. Anyone else? Could I just follow up on, um, on Chris's comments, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and also um, Michael's. Um, one of the things that I have observed since we um, have uh, been fortunate enough to have the uh, SROs in both the high school and in, the, uh, in Silas Dean is the fact that um, not only is it a great feeling of security to have these people uh, in the school district, but the other nice thing is the fact that they are establishing a rapport with the kids. And, um, and that, to me, is a really important thing. Is I, I've seen the interaction uh, between, the, um, between the officers and many of the kids, and developing that trust so that kids feel as though they can, they do have someone to talk to, and that they can, uh, they've kind of got a safe way to uh, talk about things that they might see, because the big thing is the peer pressure, and um, you know, do I really want to put myself in a position where I sound like I'm tattling, and they can go back and forth, but at least if they have a safe place to be able to express their fears, their concerns, and they know it's um, that we are concerned and we really want to make sure that, um, that we don't have a dangerous situation, but we do also want to protect people's privacy and, um, you know, because there are a lot of ways that things can be opened up. But I, I really, um, and I have expressed this to, um, to our officers and also to pretty much anybody else in the police department who will listen to me is the fact that I just am so impressed and, and thankful for the fact that, that um, our, our students have that opportunity and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Diane? Um, when was the, the last time that at the high school there was a drill done with the kids concerning um, a potential shooter or a potential hostile situation in the school. Probably about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, I think now is the time to do that. Um, some of the feedback I've heard from kids this week is they wouldn't know what to do mm -hmm. um, in that situation. And unfortunately, I was stuck home all last week flat on my back and watched that nausea and this tragedy unfold. And the one thing um, that was very clear from these kids and these teachers was their response was drilled into them um, on a regular basis. So these kids and you know, these teachers knew um, within a matter of seconds what to do and how to respond. Um, and I'm concerned that um, in the heat of the moment, our kids would not know what to do. Um, but luckily, these kids it became second nature for them. And it's unfortunate that that has to happen, but I think we need to do that immediately. And I think some of the parents who reached out to us. You know, I have to ask the question. When you say active shooter drill, the historic discussion, is that the same as a lockdown, or are they two different um, drills? Because we did lockdown drills for years. Uh, good evening. Let me clarify. Uh, we do a number of lockdown drills, uh, which would be considered an active shooter drill. Uh, we, we do at least three a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do one in each of uh, a three-month period once, right, with the others being uh, the, the fire drills. Uh, the active shooter drill that we did was similar to what Mr. Uh, Emmett was discussing, where the police actually came in. Um, they used uh, you know, a type of, of uh, paintball ammunition and, and uh, did an active shooter drill with the police department. But in terms of drilling, we, we do that on a regular basis with, yes. with our with So our the students. kids should know what to do, because the elementary kids do. They, they, know what to, they know what to do, but the active mm -hmm. shooter drill working with the police, we haven't done, uh, primarily because you know, we've been renovating. 
Okay. And, and that's without kids in the building anyway when you've done. Correct. You, you, that, you was just, that was just the partnership with the <coughs> Wethersfield Police Department. Right, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. But if we, Thank if you. we oh. had the police in to, to speak to the kids as to what, you know, what they, should, what they should do, what they should avoid, what they, you know, those types of things. How to no. respond if you're in the hall, if you get stuck in the hall and something's happened. No, that, that is a part of our, our lockdown protocol. Yeah. Um, we speak to the fact that uh, you do not listen to the fire alarm. Uh, you do not leave uh, your, your classroom. The only modes of communication are the public address system and the Remind Me app. So we've made some changes. Uh, we do speak to uh, having a, a uh, violator right in, in the school. Uh, we do this in partnership with uh, our school resource officer. We do it in partnership with uh, the fire department also, Anthony Dignati. So um, what I don't think we, we have is, um, you know, assemblies, right, dealing with this, this type of thing. We deal more in a small group advisory. We deal with it with the classrooms because I asked the teachers, they have the uh, protocols which are updated each and every year to go over them with the, the students. And quite honestly, we give the students and the teachers uh, a little bit of time before we actually do the, the drill for them to go over the drills. Uh, they're not surprises, right? So uh, we're not trying to scare anybody. It's not a gotcha type moment. It is let's review exactly what it is that you're supposed to do. Uh, where are you supposed to go? What is it that we're trying to uh, do in terms of people coming down the hallway? And I have to tell you, and, and obviously you were on the, on the building committee, the architecture of the building really lends itself to more protections, right? Because we did renovate the school after Sandy Hook. You know we don't have any of the floor to, um, uh, to, to ceiling windows. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of protections right in in place uh, our lobby is um, you know we have protection lobbies that that we're using at this point in time also and it's uh, been very helpful right we have bollards actually right so cars can't drive through I mean there's been an awful lot of thought right and um, you know the fact that that we had a, a police chief on the building committee was was helpful also he reminded us right of the things that we should That's be doing excellent. Hmm. anyone else with questions Thanks, Tom. Yep. Thank you. We all set? Okay. We'll continue on to action items. Um, we have one motion tonight. And Polly, would you please read motion 6A for us? Yep. Move that the Wethersfield Board of Education approve the Shipman and Goodwin model policies. Uh, you um, received... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Got no, it. I'm just sure that it's going to pass. Gotcha. Second. <laughs> okay. I'll second that. All right. Um, I, I just wanted to remind you, you received the first reading at the last board meeting. These will uh, replace in total the, um, the K policies that we have now. And um, they're actually, it's a smaller um, v volume, which is really nice. And we will go back, as I, I believe we're in the process of scheduling another two me meetings within the next two months. That's correct. Um, so that we can go back and look at some of our, uh, starting with our bylaws. And um, so we will go back, compare with what we have so that we don't miss anything that, um, uh, that, is, uh, that we think should be in the, um, in the shipment and Goodwin policies. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Any other discussion? No, other than they were a thrilling read and they kept me asleep all night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great thing about being uh, about being that. incapacitated is I spent my time actually reading the. I actually got through the whole thing. There so. will be a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe this is being put online now, Mike, so that you can yes. scroll through it and search it by topic. Yes. Okay, that's it will excellent. Be searchable. Yep. yep. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Just if I could, Mrs. Grinnell. Okay. Just, sure. uh, I just wanted to say also, I know we've got a meeting tentatively scheduled for the 28th of March with the Policy and Planning Committee. Um, Ms. Paradise, who's not with us this evening, um, has reported that she's already um, going through and reviewing the 9,000 series, the bylaws. Uh, she was the chair of that committee back at the time that we worked on those. 
Um, in addition to that, I actually have a teacher leader at the high school who is interested in um, working on the policies with us. That's so um, she will be joining the committee to um, provide her expertise. Oh, that's awesome. One letter, one letter. Yep, no Absolutely. problem. So it's good. <laughs> yeah, the more the merrier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion on this? And we got a second on this, Ellen? Yeah, yes. okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6A passes. Okay, so tonight we have a presentation by Sally Destoli, who is our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instructions. She's wheeling on up on our Next Generation Accountability Report. Sally? I'm gonna settle into my kitchen stool. <laughs> Actually, I think I like this stool. It's mm -hmm. to keep this. Thank Dolores. Oh. So um, uh, this is a bird's eye view of the State Department of Education's Next Generation Accountability Report. Um, I brought my folder, and hopefully you're not going to ask me a lot of questions about the numbers because they're really small this time of day, and we just dimmed the lights, so um, <laughs> it'll be difficult. Uh, but I tried to provide a, a quick summary uh, of a lot of information to kind of give you a snapshot. So uh, this current uh, accountability system uh, was revised about three years ago based upon federal legislation to meet uh, ESSA, or Every Student uh, Succeeds Act. The revisions were a great improvement. Um, they're a broader measurement of accountability. I would still argue that they're way too narrow, but compared to where we were with No Child Left Behind, we're in a, we're in a better place. So they, uh, this accountability report uh, satisfies federal and state requirements. Um, it provides transparency for the public. It, uh, again, as I said, a broader measure of um, success. Um, I, but in the past, the measure was really just uh, language arts and math, and there was a, such a streamlined focus that some districts, unfortunately, did nothing but math and language arts and lost the whole child picture. Um, and the other important thing to mention is that these index scores should not be thought of a gotcha. Uh, there are thousands of ways to measure progress around schools, and tonight we saw many examples of different ways to look, look at progress and success of schools. So I'm going to share with you again a medical analogy. That's kind of fitting. Um, my doctor could track my health with my heart rate, and my blood pressure, and my cholesterol, and uh, my vitamin D level, but that really would be a narrow measure of my health. Um, there are many medical conditions that wouldn't be diagnosed, and I sit in front of you and nothing would have been diagnosed given those measures. But doctors use a lot of different measures to look at somebody's health and do some, uh, look at health comprehensively. So while today we're gonna to be talking about 12 measures, it's only 12 out of thousands of measures we can look for school accountability and success. So in the next two slides, um, oh, I'm a little bit off here, sorry transition a little bit different here. Uh, the next two slides uh, uh, provide an over key, overview of the indicators. Um, you'll see that some of these look at proficiency, they look at growth, but some of them are also broken down into what we call all students or high needs subgroups. Um, indicator is two is based upon academic growth, which is new. Uh, growth scores are one of those improvement areas the State Department has made several years ago. So instead of just measuring the number of students that reached a target or a proficiency level, schools and districts can now look across all students uh, and ensure they're learning and growing regardless of initial proficiency. So the expectation that all students grow. So that was a, a nice improvement. Um, uh, number four is really interesting, chronic absenteeism. Um, so if you were on the board several years ago, we spent a lot of time looking at um, mm -hmm. absenteeism rates. So students that are chronically absent are defined as missing 10% of the school year or 18 days. The state average is 10% for all students and 16% for our statewide high needs population. That's a lot of students missing a lot of school. So research tells us that students with poor attendance are more likely to have lower GPAs, uh, more course failures, uh, less likely to graduate. 
For younger students, research has shown that chronic absenteeism in kindergarten is associated with lower achievement in reading and math in the upper grades. Um, and poor attendance has also been connected to lower social, economic, uh, social emotional measures, self-control, self-regulation, and positive relationship building. Um, and research will say poor attendance, even in preschool, is a likely predictor of upper grades. So research tells us attendance really matters. So this is why this was added to the accountability report. Um, the other uh, part of the 12 indicators uh, on this slide are, with the exception of physical fitness scores, uh, which are just across all levels of schools, the rest are um, primarily measuring high school measures only. So in your packet, uh, you received a copy of the district report. This is, a, a sam this is the sample district report, along with individual school reports. I'm not going to get too technical, but I'm just going to walk you through one example. So in the column labeled index or rate is the district score. So we're going to use the first example, uh, indicator 1A, English Language Arts Performance Index. So you have um, uh, the index rate, then you have the target, which is the state target, is what they'd like all districts to aim for. Um, and if the school or district reached a target, they would get the maximum number of points. So for English language arts, performance of all students, we had a district index rate of 72.5. The state target for every school is 75. So we earned 48.3 points out of the 50 maximum points. Um, when you turn that into a percent, we earned 96.7% of the points possible for that indicator. And I would encourage you to always look at that last column. Um, it's an important reference. It's the state average um, of the index rate. And we should always be above the state average. Um, in that example, the state average is a 67. So these next uh, three slides provide a <laughs> snapshot of comparison of the percent of points earned in 2015-16 uh, compared to the 2016-17 on the last column. And what I did for you for a visual is I highlighted any uh, cell that was the same or went up statistically um, as green. So you can see here that we um, uh, earned higher percentage of points or we had higher scores in performance of language arts and maths, um, but not so in science. As a district, uh, we saw a decrease in growth scores. Again, for all students um, and high need students, we saw a decrease in growth. And uh, the indicators on this slide also increased in most cases. Uh, indicator five significantly is not very significant given the uh, narrow de definition of the measurement of number five. One of the other things, um, part of these uh, reports are the, uh, what we call achievement gaps or graduation gaps. Um, and basically, let me walk you through an example. What does that mean? I'm gonna just shift it over a little bit. Um, so uh, if you could look at where it says math performance index gap, does everybody see that? The second, well, third row down. Um, we had a gap size of 20.1. Um, our gap size is larger than the state gap of 18.7. So as a district, we have what the state would identify as an achievement gap in mass, meaning uh, the difference between our uh, nine high needs and our high needs is higher than the state average. Um, we do not have a gap in graduation. We have uh, very successful graduation rates and are below the uh, state gap for graduation rates. Um, and as a district, we also met the participation rate of 95%, which is a, an accountability measure. The following slide um, compares some districts, some within our same uh, DERG or uh, district uh, educational reference group, um, others that are, have a higher um, DERG, uh, Glastonbury and West Hartford, as a comparison um, to some neighboring towns. 
Um, and here is just kind of, a, again, a brief summary. You have the entire reports in your packet, a brief summary of the accountability index. Um, as Mr. Emmett's already announced, Hamner School is once again a school of distinction. It's very exciting. Uh, top 10% in the state around students identified for all students for student growth. So congratulations goes out to the Hamner community, the staff, the students, and the parents um, for their hard work. And then so by taking a look at this data and looking at our achievement and our growth, what kind of recommendations do we have based upon this data analysis? So some of the summary recommendations we have as a result is to reinstate the STEM instructional supervisor to support teachers with aligning curriculum and skills to improve student, student achievement in these areas, both in math and science. As you know, the literacy instructional supervisor position was cut due to budget and the STEM position was not filled this year due to budget cuts. Um, there's also a recommendation to increase the tutor support for math district-wide. Some of our math tutors are grant funded and didn't start till probably almost halfway through the year because of um, grant funds and the kind of the financial status of our state. Uh, the STEM position, along with increased professional development, would fo focus on decreasing the identified achievement gap we have as a district in math along with increasing the implementation of the new science standards and for better preparing our teachers and students for the science assessment. Uh, we will be piloting the science assessment this year uh, and then the following year implementing a very rigorous, um, difficult, I have a science background. When they had sample questions that came out, I tackled the high school ones and I very quickly went to the middle school and elementary questions. <laughs> it is very rigorous. Um, we recommend increasing the professional development to again focus on increasing student growth scores for all type of learners to um, really target those growth scores. And we also, as you know, have an increased number of English language learners district wide. Um, I think we uh, registered over the last two weeks 12 new English language learners. Um, so we need to continue increasing the number of certified TESOL teachers so that we have expertise in every building with a certified uh, TESOL teacher. Sally, when we're on that, can you tell me what that means, T-E-S-O-L? Teachers yes. of English of second... Oral language? No? I didn't know either. Other language? I, thank you. I, it's Close okay. To that. It's There's so e many acronyms. Sometimes yeah. they all start, yes. But it's ELL. It's for correct, the... E English right, language. Okay. It's a certification for English language learners. So when looking at any uh, data and improvements, I want to bring you back to some of the strategic priorities we have in our draft strategic plan that's out for feedback. Um, I won't read these to you, but these are some of the things that uh, are in that draft feedback, the strategic plan around priorities of this board and district. Uh, and then one more on this slide. And then just to kind of wrap this idea is that this is a summary of 12 important indicators, or indicators that the state looks across all schools and all districts. Um, but again, it's a reminder, and uh, it really rings true tonight, as we saw um, our Emerson Williams sixth grade students and the King Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and Scott talked about school safety, um, that we have to really remember that we also have to consider these 12 but also broader measures of student achievement and school and district success because there's a lot of ways we can measure that. Any questions? Okay, any questions? Holly? Um, my, it, we made some changes in the uh, professional development and how we uh, um, dealt with it over the last um, year or so. And I'm wondering if you see any correlation between those changes um, and, and the um, what we're seeing for, for lack of a better word, scores here? Yeah, I mean, I think we've saw, I think we have to look at our, our data that trends, but I think that, um, you know, teachers are incredibly busy. Um, let's take an elementary teacher. They're planning for all their different subjects and all their students um, and planning on a daily basis to become experts in new strategies and, and kind of that, uh, moving us to a next level and the state is always providing us information about new assessments and it is changing uh, we get weekly <clears throat> information from the state that is about five pages long um, so to raise the expectations um, it would be our recommendation 
um, to increase the amount of profession development for teachers to really focus on that student growth. How do we lift the level of independence and rigor and uh, supporting student? But we have to make sure it's not just about um, language arts and math achievement because you know, research is about the whole child. It's about 21st century skills and grit and perseverance and how do you get them to be independent about their learning and have ownership for their learning. Not just about getting the, the grade, but to have that ownership and some of those characteristics we saw of our students tonight. Um, how do you get through, pers how do you persevere when you have a challenge? Um, problem solving, um, civic goals. And so um, it would be our recommendation to increase the professional development focused on that because we, we have seen a dro drop in um, uh, Christine Gross. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. John? I, I need a better definition of what the, the achievement gap means. What does this mean for like non-high needs versus high needs? I, I don't understand who we're talking about. Yep. Um, so, uh, let me get my thoughts so I can explain to the right the first time. You can take twice, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, on this slide, so we're gonna take the first, let's look at language arts, okay, the first numbers. So non-high needs means students that are, all our students that are not special ed, ELL, or um, free or reduced. So the state defini defines high needs as um, students that are ELL, special ed, or free and reduced. Um, so when you look at our- What part of our population is that? Um, some, of, some students are in more than one of those uh, indicators. So our free reduced population district wide is around 24%. Our special ed population is about 13, is it, 15, 7, 15, well, say on average 15 roughly. Um, free and reduced. ELL is increasing. I can't tell you the percentages, but we're up to, I don't know. I, I don't, I can't. Think. We're up over 300 students total yeah, in so it's, ELL. It's, and some of the students would be free reduced and ELL or special ed. And like they, they, so the total number of that, I'd have to go back and look. Um, so we're somewhere around 20% of our population is in that category for one reason or another. <clears throat> well, we'd have to, uh, free and reduced is about 24, 25%. So I'd say at least 25% of our population um, would be in that category. So uh, if we use that number as an estimate, it could be higher, 75% uh, of our population earns a score of 75 points for language arts, district-wide across all grade levels. The high needs population, the roughly 25%, but I think it's larger than that, uh, earned 59.4 points. So that means uh, our size of our gap, the difference in that, I believe, is 15 points. Um, and they have some amazing statisticians at the state that does all, all the crunching of these numbers. Compared to the state average is 16.7. So the average statewide gap difference between the non-high needs and high needs students is 16. Because our gap is lower than that, based upon the state's definition, we don't have a gap. Do we have students in those groups that aren't achieving to the same level as non-high needs? Yes, and so Connecticut is known uh, nationally about um, the achievement gap. We have a disparity between the, the, the CANs, the, the, those folks, uh, students that are achieving very well, and uh, uh, whereas in other states, the gap is not as significant in Connecticut. That is one thing statewide that we continue to focus on to um, there's legislation and training about reading and, and a whole bunch of interventions the state has put in. Um, in this case, uh, we have a, a gap in math um, that is larger than the state gap. And how do we rank in terms of the non-high needs kids versus state averages? If I just look at that category for a moment. Yeah, so if we go back to the state, um, uh, this, this slide, so you could compare the last column, which is, a, again, this is district-wide. The last column, so on indicator 1A, the state average is 67.1. Um, that's, you can compare that to the first column of 72.5. So that would be all students. Um, the second row would be English language arts, high needs. 
roughly 25% of our population on the same test scored a 59.4 comparatively to the state is 55.9. Does that help? <laughs> my, my first reaction when I saw the math and I, I heard the presentation was that we're weak on math and science across the district, but it sounds like it's really for a smaller subset of our population. And even that subset compares favorably versus state averages. Yeah, so. And we would like them to be as good as the non high needs kids. Uh, correct, uh, all students need to grow and I think um, uh, important that's why the growth scores I think are important because regardless if you start at proficiency on the test so if, if uh, in third grade you hit proficiency um, you know in the past it was always about whether you hit the target you hit you hit the grade um, whereas now you might be uh, struggling uh, but you still have accountability for growth so whether you're um, uh, a student that scores very high in the assessment, you're still expected to grow, um, or a student that scores low in the assessment, they have a way to measure that growth. Whereas in the past, you either hit proficiency or you didn't. Um, so that's an improvement in the scores. I think what's, what, there's a manual that goes along with this, is that they go three through eight for SBAC, they pull in the SAT, there's a lot of different data sources they look at, but we wanna make sure that for uh, one of our goals is equity, education across all, all groups. And so when our subgroup is higher than the state average, that is of concern because um, of equity for all students. So the STEM supervisor is a way to address that? Correct. But this is a district-wide position. Yes. It would be a district-wide mm -hmm. position, yep. That would work with teachers around curriculum instruction. Um, another recommendation is around um, support, tutoring support. Um, we just have a lot more tutor support and we have uh, reading consults that are experts in every building. We've had, um, a, we just have more support around reading and language arts than we do around math. So if we're trying to be focused on getting the high needs kids to um, perform as well as the non high needs kids, why does a district-wide position help us target that group? Is there a better way to target that group and work on those scores instead of um, increasing our work and doing it more district-wide? So uh, additional support through tutor support is important, but really what we call t um, tier one support for all students in the classroom is the most valuable time in front of a certified teacher. So our work around professional development and curriculum strategies um, gets to how to engage learners, how to differentiate lessons. Are there software programs out there we can pilot and implement to help learning in small groups? Um, because we shouldn't be doing whole class instruction. Um, we should be doing group instruction um, around any topic. And so how do we find the resources put in the hands of teachers? How do we train them on um, best using assessments to group students in different groups? and to accelerate the learners in the classroom. Um, looking at uh, becoming experts on um, the different assessments, um, SAT, um, looking at some current research, collaborating with other districts. Um, it's a way to coordinate those um, changes in curriculum instruction, motivation, um, district-wide. One last question, if I could. Go ahead. In What's the rationale why two of our schools didn't have achievement gaps, but the others did? So um, there's a couple things that go on at uh, the elementary level, um, uh, especially, so let me give, give you an example in science. Um, you have to have a size of at least 20 students of high needs to have a potential gap. They um, statistically, so in science at the elementary level, it's only tested in fifth grade. So um, a smaller school that only has 50 students, two classes, may not have a subgroup of high needs of 20 or more students. So they wouldn't be have ever a subgroup because it's only one grade level. In language arts and math, because it's tested grades three through six, um, and it's a school-wide subgroup, you're more likely to have enough students within that subgroup. So some of it is statistics, 
Um, if you look at some of these accountability reports for a K-2 school, K-2 schools don't have these state assessments. Their accountability scores are high. They're measured on absent, I think it's just attendant, attendance. If they have good attendance, their, their scores are up high. So there's, there's a flaw to some of this. Um, so um, some of it is uh, makeup of the students and if they actually have a high needs uh, group to identify a subgroup or not. Um, some of it is a work on uh, in the tier one instruction around uh, meeting individual student needs and doing small group instruction and uh, the work we've done over several years. Um, I think science is the hardest place uh, because as we provide additional if students are being pulled out of class for tutor support in reading or math, they're most likely missing science or social studies. So if there's a student receiving a lot of additional help for multiple years, science becomes a really hard area uh, because they haven't been in the classroom for all that instruction because there's only so much time in the day. Um, and we try to make the balance over the time, but there's also some scheduling limitations. So the fact that our middle school and high school do not have uh, an achievement gap in science, um, great applaud to them um, for working through that because uh, many of some of our elementary schools do because they're the larger schools um, and that is um, and part of the work we need to do in science also. We, we're just starting to focus on professional development and shifting our science to new standards. Other questions? Yeah, I go ahead. Di? Um, I have a couple questions. Under um, Weathersfield High School, the preparation for CCR, are those the AP and the um, UConn credit? Yep, so number five and six. Um, so number five and six, I'm just, because uh, I have sometimes to pull up my notes here. Number five and six are very uh, specific because they're not measuring the entire high school. They are measuring just, I believe, 11th and 12th grade. Sorry. So number five, preparation for CCR, which is college and career readiness, percent taking courses. So students in grades 11 and 12 that are participating in at least two AP courses, or IB classes, which we don't offer, uh, that's an IB um, school, um, or two courses within the 17 CTE areas, uh, business, family, consumer science, tech ed areas. Um, so it only measures, it only gives you credit for students in 11th and 12th grade. Um, and then it's percent of passing exams in the same area. So it's not looking at your 9 through 12 population, only your grades 11 and 12. Um, so so w when I looked and compared it to some of the other community communities in our jurg, we were very low at the high school for mm -hmm. percentage of passing those exams. It, it, are we going to be using this data to develop a strategy to bring that score up? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those uh, recommendations and things that we can look at this data to make those, and I think it's it, also... That's, that's long been an issue, as you know, mine, that those, those courses need to yeah. be amped up so those kids can pass those exams. Um, also, when you, when you, uh, the percent taking the courses, what did you notice as you were looking at the other school well, not, I mean, Percent passing exams. Yeah. How about the percent taking courses? What, did you notice any trends on that one too? Um, yes. And off the top of my head, um, we were consistent with some, but then lower than others. Um, and also what is the plan? Um, cause I've had a couple parents reach out to me about the four for Wethersfield high school. What is the plan to address that? So, um, cause that's. So in your packet um, on, the Weathers, score. on the Weathersfield High School, it's, it's on this PowerPoint, but I'll show you what it kind of looks like. Um, the, on your packet um, on the Weathersfield High School report, on the bottom right hand corner, there is a little chart like on the bottom of this slide about participation rate. So we have a requirement of a 95% participation rate. Um, what happened was, uh, again, um, if I, the high needs uh, students that took science, um, I can't tell you off the top of my head how many that is, but uh, 20, 20% uh, 20 roughly of a 10th grade class, I'm sorry, 11th, 
10th, no, it's still 10th grade, it'll be 11th grade. Uh, out of the high needs population, we did not hit the 95% participation rate. Again, our free and reduced, some of those students um, are chronically absent, uh, special ed and ELL. Um, I would say, I would estimate uh, there might have been three students that um, refused, didn't, for whatever reasons, uh, finish the exam and did not give us a 95% participation rate. So that is why um, the rest, as you can see, the rest of the indicators have grown, um, are in the green area, but that is why it is a focus school. And lastly, um, <coughs> this data is two years out of date already, right? Yeah, it's based upon, la yeah, it takes that long for the state You're to- You're mentioning the class of 2016 in here. Uh, yep, it was 1617, so it was last year's cohort of students. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I also had a question on the same slide, so very nice that you're there. Um, um, as John mentioned, there's a little bit of a science and math trend, which mm -hmm. we're planning on attacking with the, uh, the coordinator that we're hoping to hire. Um, my question is about the, uh, the ELA on Silas Dean and Wethersfield High. Is there any analysis or any conclusion that you can draw that those are popping up later in the education process? Are we not preparing these kids to do this when they get older? That's a really great question. So um, I think that uh, education um, has become more rigorous. You know, Bobby and I talked recently about kindergarten as really first grade. Right, uh, and our seventh grade is really an eighth grade, and you know, so the rigor of expectations has have gone up. Um, I think that uh, we have, and, and I think, and I guess this is bigger than Weathersfield. I think the Common Core standards and the shift to higher rigor, um, in my opinion, um, increases our achievement gap. So while we have many students able to reach higher levels, we have some students that are struggling with um, the old expectations of proficiency um, and it's difficult for them and we're providing extra tutor support and trying to help, but we, we have limited resources. We, we, my magic wand is not working today, but we have limited resources. We have some complex family situations. Uh, we talked about the power of the Keene Foundation and supporting um, children with adults and um, there is a story behind all of these students that aren't meeting proficiency and we are there to support them along the way. But I think that the struggle is, the, the expectations are increasing and we have a lot of evidence to say that we're making some great growth. But uh, my worry is that as a state, this work um, is important, but again, it's a work of equity um, for all students and the, the achievement gap worries me as a state and as a nation, frankly, around uh, moving the entire kind of body of society forward um, and the importance of that in a democratic society. So I think that's part of the, the expectations continue to climb and the gap kind of shows more once you get to the secondary level. Thank you. Okay. But what we should see though, Ginger, is that um, on those growth scores, that's why I would advocate that they're probably even a more important measure of our success because regardless of what your proficiency is, so if you're not meeting proficiency, the growth scores of moving everybody forward along that continuum of growth uh, is a really important measure. And so I think over the years as we have other assessments and more information, our goal is to um, look more at growth and development along that continuum than just proficiency like we've done in the past. Anyone else? I have two comments. Um, number one, you started the analogy about the doctor. Well, you know, we get these numbers all the time as educators. That's important, but the most important part of this, and I'm looking at, it, is recommendations. What do you do with this data? Right. Um, and I do want to um, uh, talk to Polly's question about professional development. And we've had that discussion. Professional development is what pushes the system forward. We've said that many, many times. 
The problem a few years ago was the model, not professional development. I just wanted to make that clear. And the other piece, and I have to tell you, you learn something new all the time. We had a conversation in Michael's office concerning passive learners. I want you to know that was brand new to me because we have such wonderful children here in the Wethersfield school system, believe it or not, it becomes a problem that they're sitting there nicely. And what they're not doing is they're not owning their learning like we want them to. And perhaps young, old, it doesn't matter what age they are, the more we can get these children engaged in their work and owning it, um, and it also has a lot to do with this leadership leadership model, and that's something I want to talk about at the retreat. We can put that on our agenda. Um, it's kind of ironic, our kids are so well behaved, make some passive learners where we want more engaged learners, so it's something really we should talk about. Yeah, okay. most definitely. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to meetings held. Um, Polly, you're on with our CREC Council. I was checking the schedule to see if I was on yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I attended my first um, CREC meeting last week, and um, there, there it, it, was, it was actually very interesting because there were a lot of districts involved, and uh, they seemed to be very and it's, it's interesting to get that perspective because um, as I um, graciously mentioned to them, I always tend to think of our relationship with CREC as being an us versus them. And um, so it, was, it is kind of nice to understand what, they, um, uh, what their goals are. And actually they provided a really great uh, slideshow which kind of explained the whole uh, where they were in some of the, uh, their goals and where they have been over the last several years over funding and et cetera, et cetera, which I have the slides for, so if anyone wants um, to see them, I'll You're going to do a presentation forward. now? Yeah, I'll do a little presentation. <laughs> it's only going to take like an hour. I, really, we'll be out of here soon. I think do we have to stay? Put it in the private <laughs> if, you want, if you want to send it to me, I'll put it in the private uh, screen. All right, um, the other thing, the basic, uh, basically there were a couple of pieces of business. One was that um, there has been, as, as we all know, they've been, uh, CREC has been building um, magnet schools throughout the state. This has been in, um, so that they can comply with uh, Chef O'Neill. And the, the um, so the schools have been built at the, um, at the request of the state. There is one that is now um, in process. This will be, uh, situated in Rocky Hill, a, st a STEM themed school called the uh, Academy of Aerospace and Engineering Elementary School. It'll go from pre-K to five, and it'll be, um, right now they ha they're in a rented space, and they will go be able to accommodate, um, they'll go from 434 students to be able to accommodate 704. <gasps> So they, um, it, so they are in the process of um, working with DAS to, um, to start with uh, phase one for the bidding. So they gave us a, uh, a cost of that. The second thing was, yeah, so this uh, school, by the way, is cost, the money has been allotted. It's, and so it's not any additional money, but it's uh, roughly $61 million that for this school. Um, they also, uh, there were some changes to, for afternoon, um, after school funding and before and after school uh, programs. They also, um, I guess, belatedly approved the 2018-19 calendar. And the big thing that, that I took away from that, and I think we'll need to address it in our own policy committee meeting, is um, the first reading for the student data protection and privacy policy, um, 
which is responding, which will respond to uh, state changes um, around the requirements for um, student data protection and privacy. And as was mentioned there, and I think we've also actually addressed it very briefly here, is it's very difficult for districts to approve it because there's the problem of districts using vendors who refuse to comply with these uh, requirements as far as um, privacy is concerned. So I think that's, there are, at this point, there are hearings scheduled uh, at the Capitol. And um, so they are, you know, they, the legislature really has to address it. Whether they will understand this, um, you know, the difficulties that districts have um, remains to be seen, but it is a kind of a two-edged storm, a uh, sword. So <laughs> that was it, and um, I didn't stay for lunch, but it looked okay. very good. Okay, it is. They're very <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, thank you, Polly. We had a special Board of Ed meeting, our budget workshop, John Cassio. Thank you, Bobby. Um, well, we're all aware on the 13th of February, the superintendent presented their bu his budget to us and uh, at 3.97% uh, with the budget. On Thursday, February 22nd, the board met and we had, I believe, a good conversation. Um, we we're looking at different categories of savings uh, and giving suggestions to the administration. Uh, one of the things, you know, before we go into our other meeting next week, uh, next Thursday, is that we have, a, I think, a very strong administrative team that is there to help the community, the schools, and preserve what we've worked so hard for. So I think when we go into Thursday's meeting, we look at what we have, and I think that uh, the board members present offered some suggestions to streamline and to look at different categories and I think that's important and I think it was a real good give and take conversation that we had with uh, uh, within ourselves at the board meeting uh, last week. Um, we have a calendar that we have to also continue to look at and you know we have uh, approval date of the 15th of March to approve a budget correct? from the Board of Ed. March 13th, we're going to approve it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and then we present the uh, budget uh, to the Town Council. I know that um, meeting date came across, and then the uh, budget has to be approved by the Town Council by the 15th of May. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a pretty short timeline to go out through this, so our work is cut out for us. I think we're gonna get excited to get together this week. <laughs> and uh, I, know I, am. I, I tell you, I can't wait to do it again, Polly. <laughs> you know, it would be great. But we're really working hard, and I think that everyone has the best interests of the community, but we also have to look at what we have and we want to preserve what we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, John. And then we had shared services, Ginger. Uh, yeah, just to uh, add a little bit to what Mr. Emmett already told us, we met on February 21st to continue the discussion on the combination of the town and board maintenance departments upon the retirement of Mr. Bushy. Uh, we were presented with a sample memo of understanding, that was the MOU that Mr. Emmett was speaking about, that Enfield used when they did a similar combination back in 2008. Um, as well as a draft position summary for the position which has now been posted for the, um, the director of the custodial service that will report through the town but be very closely allied with the uh, school administrations and the building administrators in town. Um, one thing that I happened to I found out at this meeting that I didn't, hadn't really thought about that this is not only an opportune time um, to combine these departments because of Mr. Bushy's retirement, but it's also um, an opportune time because there was a lot of interaction between the departments as a result of the high school renovation. And so a lot of these people already know each other, they've worked together, um, and that will be helpful going forward as we work through this process. Um, 
The Shared Services Committee plans to widen its view once we've gotten through this more nitty gritty, let's do this right now project and look at more strategic and long-term goals um, for the future of the town and the board. And that's it. Thank you, Ginger. Okay, we have meetings scheduled. We have our wellness committee, which is tomorrow night. Memorial Day par a Parade Committee, which is February 28th, that same night, John, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We have a special Board of Education meeting, another budget workshop on Thursday, March 1st, 6.30. Facilities and Maintenance Committee on March 8th at 6 o'clock. And WEC, Weathersfield's Early Childhood Collaborative on March 12th at 4.30. Do we get them all? Sometimes we're missing, okay. Um, and for unfinished business, I, I would like to make a comment about, um, and I'd like to put this on the agenda too for our Board of Ed meetings held. The first meeting of the Weathersfield Academy Advisory Board met last night. So this is the next step following our think tank for the Academy model. Um, we're looking to create meaningful career learning opportunities for our students. So several ideas are being worked on already. It's the lunch and learns, mentoring, job shadowing and industry tours, parent directory, and a student interest survey. And that would be referring to their careers. A great group of people working for our kids' futures. So I'm thrilled it got started. Um, again, public comment. Is there anyone wishing to come on up and make a public comment? Please come to the podium, state your name and address, and may I remind you that public comments are limited to five minutes. Okay, are there any board comments? John? Yes, I'd like to uh, remind the community and the board uh, that the uh, Mayor's Charity Ball is coming mm -hmm. up. And this is going to be uh, Friday, June 1st at the Weathersfield Country Club. So the plans for the 2018 Weathersfield Mayor's Charity Ball are already in full swing. Uh, last year, thanks to the generosity of our local businesses and residents, $25,000 was distributed to the Kids Weekend Backpack Meal Program, Senior Meal Program, and Early Education Scholarship Program all within our community. This year, the hope of the committee is to achieve the amount again to continue assisting organizations in this community. So you can see from the start of the meeting to the end of the meeting, there's a lot of volunteers and going mm -hmm. on within our community and to uh, you know, make it happen for individuals and that need assistance. So June 1st, 2018, I know we had to Board of Ed table last year. It was so much fun. And administrators. So mm -hmm. tickets are going on sale. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with comments? I just wanted to thank the, the uh, um, superintendent for the heads up on the cheese sandwich uh, memo. Just want to thank you so much for that. We're working on it. Yes, mm -hmm. we are. Good. Let's... <laughs> okay, anyone else? Michael? Uh, just an update. Uh, this evening, our uh, ladies basketball team had a uh, first round match against uh, Lyman Hall. They were victorious and oh, will be good. heading off right. to uh, face Pomparag on uh, Friday at 7 o'clock at Pomparag. Great. Thanks. Congratulations. Great. Great athletes at that high school. Anyone else? Well, I'm, I would like to just to make a comment as we're closing tonight. You know, this past week, and we've talked about it already tonight, has been filled with emotion. The empathy for those lost students in Florida and for their families who must somehow go on with their lives despite this loss. But I want to remind you that we as a board and as administrators and teachers really have two priorities when it comes to our students in our charge. The first is always to ensure their safety first. The second, of course, is to provide them the best education we possibly can. We know that we are providing the latter, the very best education possible, and that we are filling our students with excitement for their futures. And when it comes to safety, I know that we also are doing the very best we can to ensure the well-being of our children in every possible way. 
Um, it was difficult this week, and I contacted Chief of Police Citran, and I sat down with our Director of Security, Hal Even, and I frequently do that now, to discuss issues related to security. But we also speak on a proactive basis. Both have assured me that anything that can be done to guard our children is in place, and that they constantly review and reevaluate our policy, systems, and procedures. In that regard, we are always looking for new ideas to enhance our protection, their protection. I assure you, we will leave no stone unturned in making the Weathersfield Public School System as safe as it can be. Um, you know, all of us, as we watched Florida and are now amazed by these kids from Parkland, um, you bring it home and you think about uh, Weathersfield, Connecticut. And um, those were my reasons for sitting or talking to Jimmy Citrin and sitting down with Hal Even and Michael. Um, and they assured me that we really are as safe as we possibly can be. Um, so on that, um, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Okay, a second? <coughs> All second. in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all and good night.